Very great. So uh, the title of this talk is Functional Programming with Colin. I just uh, wanna know how many of you know Colin beforehand? How many of you have used it uh, on your projects? If it's the case, or if this is the first time you uh, heard about Colin, please let us know on the chat. So I'm a software engineer at Pedidos Ya. I've been an Android developer for about uh, seven years. Before that, I was a full stack developer, mainly developing uh, web applications. My name is Raymond Artiaga, as I told you before. And today we will be covering this first, uh, these four uh, questions. First, what is functional programming? Second, what is a functional programming language? Then, why we can say that Colin is a functional programming language. And it, at the end, we will be answering questions or any doubt you may have during the talk. So the first section of this talk is called, what is a functional programming? Where is it? I'm sure you all uh, have heard about functional programming, but some of you might be asking what it really is. So the answer to what is functional programming will be, Functional programming is programming with functions. As you can see the meme there, you may think, well, that's mind blowing. Of course, that functional programming is programming with functions. But we, uh, we might deep dive on this concept of functional programming and try to discover what it is. To see that, I just want you to see this smart function that we have here. It's called do something. Just give it a couple of seconds and try to figure out how what this function specifically does. Can you please, in a matter of seconds, determine what this function does? It will probably take you more than a couple of seconds, right? Now, please try to identify what this other function does. And if at least you have an idea, please raise your hand. Okay, this function obviously is written in a more clearer way than the previous one. Even if you don't know what a uh, map is, you will probably identify this uh, core parts of this function and will rapidly know what this function does. You will know that this part of the function will filter this element list. This next part will group it using uh, a key or a, an identifier. And this one will create a map of that uh, elements list. So these both functions does exact the same thing, but this one is written in a more concise and readable way. Why we say that this is functional programming? Well, if you see here, we are using a function, but all the code is just written there. And when we read it, we need to uh, keep in mind every piece of this code so we know what uh, this function is doing. We need to remember what this variable contains. We need to remember in what a part of this cycle we are. We need to remember with our all efforts what this results list is uh, having, if we are adding items or not. So it gets tricky to understand what this function does. So when we read this other function, it's way more clearer for us Okay, just move it to the side a bit. Can you all see it now? Okay, great. I was not aware that Zoom <laughs> covered the, the screen in gray. So great. When we read this function, it's way more easier to us to understand what it does, just because it's written in a more uh, concise and readable, readable way for us. So we are not machines, we are human beings. And when we write code, it's important to keep in mind that other developers like us will be reading our code, not only the machine. So that's why a functional programming is a huge asset for us as developers. Functional programming is, as you can see here, hide the logic that you can see here in this function behind function names that are self-explanatory like these ones. 
filter, group by, and map. So the logic is the same, but it's hidden behind these function names that are, are easily readable by us. And we can know just by reading the function body what it does. So that's what uh, why functional programming is good for us. It's just using functions, but in a readable way, cascading for the functions so we can keep in our minds in a more easier way what a function does. Just let me know if you can continue seeing the presentation. Okay, great. So what is a functional language then? It depends on who you ask. If there's any Haskell or F sharp developers here, you will probably say that your language is the only functional language that is there. But the general agreement is that a language can be considered as a functional programming language when it complies with at least uh, these uh, items that we listed here. So when a language treats functions as first class citizens, it, it can be considered as a functional programming language. When functions can be passed as an argument, when functions can be returned from a function, or when functions can be assigned to a variable. So why can't we say that Kotlin is a programming uh, language? Because it complies with all the previous items that we just listed. So now let's dive deep, let's deep dive uh, into what is functional programming with Kotlin and the features that Kotlin has to offer to us when we are talking about functional programming. So in Kotlin, what's a function? It's pretty simple. If we want to define a function, we just write the keyword fun that it, it comes to, to the case in this scenario. Then the name of the function, parentheses, and the body of the function. So this uh, might be the way to define a function in Kotlin. So it's pretty easy, as you can see. If our function accepts any parameter, we uh, type the parameter names and types inside the this uh, parenthesis. So let's say we can take uh, an integer. And if we are going to return an integer, we type it this way and then return, for example, number multiplied by two. So this is a pretty basic function in Kotlin. Now in Kotlin, it is important to know that a function can return at least two interesting types that will be this one. Here you can see that we are not specifying any return type, but behind the curtains, we can say that this function is returning an unit. So a unit is something like the void in C++, except it's not the same. So when we inspect this code, we see that unit is an object. In Kotlin, we can have objects and classes. The objects in Kotlin are kind of the objects in, in JS. So we can agglomerate properties in, in, in a single object. And uh, that's a good uh, feature on Kotlin to use objects. So if a function is not a program to return a value, then we just use unit. Now, another interesting uh, type that a function can return in Kotlin will be nothing. You would say, what is this? Well, nothing is precisely uh, intended to use when a function will not return or will not complete its execution in a in a throughout manner. For example, we can throw an exception here. And in this case, the function, this function will never succeed. So we can declare it as a returning nothing. And the IDE will issue a warning whenever we try to use it, this function and write code after that. For example, if we do this, if you use the function do something. And after that, we try to write any more code. We will see that this code is unreachable because we declared that this function returns nothing. 
So uh, in Kotlin, we can have units, we can have nothing, and we can have functions returning any. Any will be uh, something like uh, the object in Java. So it's the base class for every object in Kotlin. It's called any. So this is how you declare or define a function in Kotlin. Now let's see what can we say that Kotlin is a functional language. How are these functions considered a first class citizens in Kotlin? First of all, we say that a, a language can be considered as a functional language when we can assign functions to variables. How we can do that in Kotlin? It's simple. We just write the keyword well used to define a value, the name, start function. And we can just use the colon colon notation. And here it is. Now, some function will be stored in this value. And if we happen to use this function, okay, I see a hand raised. Let me see if I can see it here. Well, I cannot see <laughs> uh, still, I think. Okay. Well, if we happen to want to use, okay, let's just see missing here, to use the function stored in this variable, we just use it this way. And we pass uh, the number that we want to uh, enter as a parameter on this function. So we will pass the two, and we now can use the function stored in this uh, start function variable. Just to be more concise, Colin doesn't impose the necessity to use the invoke, and we can do we can just do it this way. So here we can uh, see that Colin complies with this uh, item of uh, being possible to store functions inside any variable we want. So this function has a type, as you can see, it uh, consumes an integer and returns an integer. So the type of this function will be consumes an integer and returns an integer. This will be the type of this function. If we happen to have another function that for example, takes two parameters like zoom, A and B, and we try to assign this function to this same variable, we will see that this is an error because we are requiring just a function that takes an integer and returns an integer, and we are trying to store a function that takes two integers and returns one. So there's type safety when we uh, are talking about functions in calling. So that's great for Colin. The third item that we had on our list is, I mean, we are by the second, right? Okay. Ah, is that it can be returned from a function. So as we were telling before, we can have a function. Okay. And this function will be returning an integer. Okay, just like this. So this function right now returns another function, a function that accepts an integer and returns an integer. We can, for example, do it this way by creating a lambda. It's plus two. So these two functions, okay, I'm reading a question here. Is there a use case you use to our function when some function is already available? Well, let's, let's dive deep into it. Let's, for example, suppose that we are creating a calculator. Yes, yes, let's just answer that question that we got on, on the chat. 
let's uh, create a, a calculator and when the user press a, a key, for example, the user presses the divide uh, operator on its cable and we are having a, a character here, a chart that will be operation. Oh, will be sharp. Let's uh, suppose that the user to press the, the divide charter on its keyboard. So we might here inside create a one expression operation on. If the user, for example, presses the divide, we can return this. Let's take two part two values instead. And a, B, A, and B. So, enter. Okay. And this is not even necessary. Okay. And else. So, um, an exception here. I mean, we will be talking about exceptions afterwards. Okay, we can do it just like this. If the user, for example, pressed the multiply keyboard, we are going to perform this operation. And so on, so on. So we can here on, on our main function, intercept the key that the user uh, pressed, and we can just get the operation with the key that the user pressed that might be stored on the arguments or something like that. Let's assume the user uh, just pressed the multiply option. And we can pass the other numbers that we got, for example, for the arguments again. Let's take two and two. So, if the parameter that the user introduced on the on the arguments of the program is uh, this symbol, then the get operation will return this function. Otherwise, it will return uh, this function if this happens to be the character that the user introduced on the parameters, or else uh, this will throw a not uh, found operation. So this uh, might be an use case. I mean, it's pretty basic, but you will probably be able to find more use cases for this uh, specific feature of coding of returning multiple uh, functions using the same signature. So let's see how much time we have. Okay, great, we are on time. So great, okay, maybe when you want to pass that stuff function or on the right function. Okay, that's another use case. So let's uh, go back to where we were before. We were talking about being returned from a function, okay, assigned to a variable and being passed as an argument. So we already covered uh, the three options. So here the function is stored in a, in a variable. Here, uh, this is a return from a function. And we can, for example, uh, let's just clear this up. And let's uh, have, our duplicate function. So it will return an integer just to keep the things uh, simple. Okay, number multiplied bar by two. Okay. Uh, Oh, I, I think I have this uh, function. Okay, here it is. Okay, great. Now we have a defined a pretty simple function here. As you can see, it just takes an integer and it returns the same number multiplied by two. Now let's say that we uh, want to pass this function to another function. How we do that? Yes. Your order function. That's why how we call order. That's uh, how we call encoding in functions that take another functions as parameters. Let's uh, put this uh, operation again. Um, 
time just enter the signature of the function we are expecting. So it takes an integer and it will return another integer. Okay, great. Uh, okay, it's where we, okay. So if we want to pass a function to this other function, it's pretty simple. We just call function by, by its name or the function in this case. And we can pass inside the parentheses the name of the function we want to pass as a parameter just using the uh, two columns annotations before. So duplicate. Okay. That would be it. And then when we execute this function, mm -hmm. no, we are not returning anything yet. So let's uh, add, add that. So this function will now return an integer. And what we are going to do inside this function is to execute the operation that we got as a parameter. So we are going to return operation. We are going to invoke it. Uh, okay, it will take an integer. So, okay, great. This is actually not a good example of this. So, okay, let's move to, to here because I'm going to, to complicate your lives. I'm about to complicate your lives with this. Let's use this example that I got uh, prepared instead. So, Let's just control set here and just erase it. Okay, let's use it here. So, okay, we have uh, here inside this uh, function that takes the same uh, function we had before as a parameter. So we can uh, do it in uh, many ways. For example, we can use, use execute operation and inside the Parentheses, we can call or, or use this function or this one as a parameter. We just use the two columns. Okay, execute, suspend, let's see the error. Okay, it's just, no, it's duplicate. Okay, great. There it is. So we can call this function passing this function that we have here. And when we execute this, we will have. Let's run the program, just a second. And we will have, so we have an error here. Oh, let's erase that. Great. Okay, great. Well, now I, <laughs> I prepare a long sample and we will not have time to cover it all. So, okay. I don't, I don't know if this uh, have even happened to us, to, to you. But I'm probably sure that you're all developers and all of you have uh, been in this position suffering uh, from the computer's rage upon you. So here we have uh, the duplicated uh, number. In this case, we pass two as a parameter. The, op the operation that, that we pass on the parameter operation was duplicate. So two duplicated will be four. Happens all the time to me when I saw, yes, that happened, that happens. Okay, but that's fine, it happens. Okay, great. And now if we pass instead the triplicate function, we will see that instead of four, we have six because we pass this other function as a parameter. Now, what happened if we want to pass another operation instead of functions that we have already defined? When in calling, we can also pass lambdas as I showed you before, to perform any kind of operation. We can have the number, will be type integer, and we just are going to, to quadruplicate the, the value. In this case, will be number multiplied by four. Okay. Here we can have, we have another way to pass functions as a parameters using lambdas, but in calling, we can do it in a more expressive way. So in calling, when the last value of, or, or the last parameter of a function is another function, we can write that function or lambda after the parentheses. So this would be the case. Now it looks prettier. And 
As we don't have any parameters inside the parentheses in this uh, function, we just uh, are expecting a single parameter. We can also erase the parentheses, but it can get even better. When we have single uh, parameter lambdas, we can omit the number of the parameter and just the type inference of calling will tell us that it's an integer and it will be automatically named as it. It's something like Ruby, I guess. So you might or might not be related to this concept of automatic error naming of variables inside the specific scopes. So we can uh, pass the Lambda uh, after the function in this case, and it looks uh, pretty awesome. So, okay, let's pass uh, to the next uh, thing we can do in Kotlin with functions, which are extension functions. Here we have a list of elements. As you can see, we have only three strings, red, green, and blue. Let's say we want to create a function that allows us to pick a random element or item inside that list. What can we do? In all languages, we might do something like this. We create a function that takes the list as a parameter, realizes uh, all the computation, and just returns the the number that we want, the random uh, element inside that list. So this is easy. But what happened is some other developer, let's say we are working on a big project and some other developer needs to do this exact same thing. What can, what can happen is that that developer will not know that we created this function here, if it's not documented, or even if it, it is documented, that the other developer will need to go to check if that function is defined that uh, in practice just doesn't work. Developers don't look for pre-existing functions if they're not uh, easily accessible. So that creates the risk to uh, have duplicated code across our code base, which is pretty bad for us and can impact also our productivity because we may be missing things that already are done. So we, the other developer, will just duplicate this function and do it on its file. So we don't want that. What calling uh, offers to give a solution to this problem is extension functions. What are extension functions? Well, this function that we have here can be defined as this other way. We are trying to apply this extension function to a list of strings. So we start typing just that. What are we trying to extend? Um, just pick random item. Okay, great. Uh, this was already defined. Uh, this was already defined. It's two times. Oh no, it's here too. Let's just erase it. It's okay. And this too. Okay. Uh, this can be written in this other style that is uh, more readable for us. We, we just copy the inside code of this previous function. And we can use this that will always point to this uh, element we are just trying to extend. Okay. Okay. This function will return a string. Okay, great. Now these two functions does exact the same thing, but what's the benefit of using extension functions? That when a, a developer tries to access this list of elements automatically, when it uh, writes a, a dot or types a dot after the name of the collection, he will get the name of that extension function right away. So he will know uh, the capabilities of your program or if it's implemented somewhere else. We, of course, have to use uh, names that reflect what the function does, because if we use names that absolutely have nothing to do with what we are trying to achieve, then the other developers will be misled. But if we use uh, names that reflect what we are doing, they will be uh, available for everyone that wants to use uh, all the things that we have done, uh, for example, for processing this list of string. We can just do this and get rid of this. Now, whenever we try to uh, process a list of strings, 
and we type a dot after it, we will get all the extension functions listed as if it were they were members of this list uh, of strings. So that's a nice perk of calling too. Uh, there are other things to cover, but I think we will not have time today to, to cover it all. Just uh, a last thing uh, I have to, to share with you is for example, of these kind of functions that accepts more than, than one parameters or exactly two parameters. Oh, I had this sample over here well, and I don't find it. So let's just share it quickly. If we have a function that accepts exactly two parameters, for example, um, sum, B. Okay, and returns integer. Okay, it will return num A plus num B. If we had this, we can call this in two ways. Let's go to the main function again. So we can do just sum. Uh, one and two, this is perfectly okay, but we have another uh, way of typing this in a more, in a more concise or, or readable way. We can just uh, use this name for a function. And um, this is called in fix function. Fix, it's a keyword. Okay, okay, yes. It's actually written like this. Uh, this plus numbi. Okay. And we can just type this notation and we can store this in another variable. So now we see that this function can be used uh, between two uh, values and we can read it in a more, uh, in a better way, let's say. I mean, it's an option you have in Colin. It's good to know. Another thing is that you can just get rid of uh, all these boilerplate if you are writing just uh, pretty small uh, functions and just do this and Colin will infer the type that you are returning from the right side of the expression. So there were also uh, many things to cover, but I think that the time is uh, running for us. So let's just make a quick uh, QA session. If you have any question, just type it on the chat and we will try to, to explain it in the minutes that are left to the talk. Uh, maybe we will uh, create another talk in the future to, to cover the remaining topics for Colin because it's a huge world uh, when we are talking about uh, functional programming with Colin. So if you have any question, please uh, type it on the, on the chat and let's uh, cover it. Okay, well, I think there are no questions. So it looks it was uh, pretty well covered, understood. Okay, great then. So I will be sharing on the event page, I will be sharing some links uh, containing uh, all the code that we looked today. Uh, I will be sharing also some uh, documentation links that you can use to enrich your knowledge about uh, functional programming and specifically Kotlin. So hope to see you all soon and let's uh, wrap it up. Wish you all a good night. I don't know what time is in, in your country, but wish you all the best. So let's uh, wrap it up. And uh, let's uh, throw a quick message on the chat. So you all know and follow along with the rest of the information. So with that link, you can access the main page of the event and can uh, follow along with any other uh, resources that I will be sharing soon on the event page. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, I think I'm not sharing. Oh, okay, let's share it over here. Okay, can you see now the message? You can follow along on that uh, specific link of the event and continue learning coding and functional programming. 
So, okay, I just resent it. So good night to everyone and see you soon on the internet. <laughs>